right, welcome everybody. It is Tuesday afternoon and after a long morning, we're sorry, here on, um, we're gonna work first on H244, which is our bill authorizing the natural organic reduction of human remains. And we were just about ready to vote this bill out on Friday before our break. Um, but the way the floor went and everything else uh, and the weather, I believe, was Thank you, yes. an issue on Friday. And so we postponed the vote on that till today. We do not have Katie with us. I don't know that we need any. And we had talked to her and agreed that we were all set on this bill. And um, I guess the question is, first, is the clerk ready mm -hmm. for a vote? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Almost. Well, she's getting organized. Can I do you have a copy it? of the okay again for the release yes. on Friday? Because it was a historic pileup on our interstate. Oh, there's not been a 36 car yeah, crash on our interstate before, including yeah, with fatality. It, right? And it actually is after my exit, but it is not after. Lisa's or other members of our house. I went by about an hour before it happened. Yeah, uh -huh. and because you really, because we were able to leave, we, yeah. we were able to be beyond that moment, which truly uh, cool. was yeah. a fear that we were holding. So yeah, uh, thank you. No, it, it made a difference. Good. It was. Um, I mean, it was gross. Just even between here yeah. and Waterbury, it was just a, a struggle. It was sad to hear that it. Yep. Yeah. That someone died. Yeah. Sad to hear about a 36 car pile of yeah. yeah, no, it was frightful. And, and you can see how easy it happens. Yeah, too. sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And did they think it was because of squalls or just icy roads? I think a little of both. I don't think they ever came out and said. Um, but I know when I went through, there was enough powdery snow on the pavement that when a truck went by oh yeah they said that was yeah. part of it actually. and you couldn't the see what you lose the car ahead of you so, yep. and well, if you're yep. going too fast yes well, or just going what you think is fine speed but aren't yep. aware that yep. you need to slow every time it just well if you're under a squall too i mean i i was driving down route 12 and people were joking a couple of weeks ago about oh my god i got a weather report it said squall and, no they were outrageous and, they were. And I, I came across one that could have been more than 50 yards long, but it was, it's, you know, on Route 12 in Northfield, you're just like, yep, hoping like yep. this going around the corner. It was like, whoa. Yep. So, anyway, mm -hmm. I didn't mean to hold up the conversation, but I did want to say it, it truly made a difference. I'm glad you're good. You're safe. Yep. Yeah, I forget how many hours it took me to get home, but it was a lot longer. Yeah, it was miserable long. driving. Well, it was the right choice, but that leads us to just this work today. Yep. Um, so if the clerk is ready, did we map long enough there, Mary? Yes, we okay. did. <laughs> <laughs> and I Thank just you. want to verify that as we're doing this, because we don't have our ledge council, we did clarify that the burial ground language is not part of this, even though it's still a numerous page bill for other little edits. The we change, did remove we that did change. not change that. <laughs> <laughs> Katie McGorn actually just entered the way Oh, okay. Uh -huh. We stalled long enough for her to. <laughs> um, I think the, the goal of deleting any references to that was because Absolutely. we felt that that was a much more substantive issue not yep. to be covered just in, a, in an update very easily. Yep, and I appreciate that. Thank Welcome, you. Katie. How are you? Look at you. You're in the building. I'm well. How are you? Good. Hi, Katie. Um, well, we won't keep you long. We we're just about to. Um, <clears throat> we were just about to uh, entertain a motion on 244. And I guess the question was, right as you were coming in, was just a clarification from Representative Murphy that this doesn't, this finished bill that we have does not deal with the burial ground changes that we, that was in the original bill is introduced at all. Correct. Yep. It doesn't change with the burial ground changes. I would note for you that um, in the past hour, I, I did just get an email from the health department with a concern. Would you like to hear that concern? I, I, I emailed it to you, Mr. Chair. I think that's a question. Yeah, I think better, yes. Let Katie say it. Yes. Yes. Sorry for the bear of bad news. Right. Um, okay. 
Um, there is a concern on page seven, line 17. Do you want me to pull up the draft or do you have it in front of you? Um, I have it. I have if it. you could pull it up, that would be helpful. Can you make Katie okay. So while we're waiting, are you scheduled to head out? Do you have to go to commerce at, all? at four o'clock? So okay. I have plenty of time. It's three years. Three years. Yeah. Seven, seven months. Seven, 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 seven. Thursday. So the language in question, um, this um, subdivision C1 basically says um, that the Office of the medical examiner is to um, hold on to remains for three years. And the health department raised the concern that due to the um, amount of remains, um, when a, a body is processed with natural organic reduction, that this would be a capacity problem as opposed to the cremated remains don't take that same storage capacity. Um, so if you chose to address it, I could probably pretty quickly um, just amend this strike all. What I would do is get rid of the language um, or processed so that um, a funeral director or disposition facility operator, um, if they've cremated remains, so it takes away um, the, the option of processing with natural organic reduction. And I'd also get rid of as applicable I guess the flip side of the argument is, is um, you know, maybe if if there was knowledge that there was nobody to take the remains, the option wouldn't be used to use natural organic reduction, but cremation would be the option, so they don't run into that problem. I'm I'm sorry if if you could restate, Katie. Their concern was to to their capacity or to the disposition facilities capacity because it's it's the facility or the funeral director who have to retain and and we did have discussion on that we took testimony on that from those you did part. okay um let me look at this more closely i th i think their concern was um the the office of the medical examiner so let's see um, if, if the disposition is determined by A9, which is the funeral director or disposition facility operator with custody of the body after testing and writing good faith, um, so they, they could make the decision. So if yeah. they, if then, then the funeral director or the disposition facility operator has to hold on to their remains. Right. And I, I hear what you're saying, that you took testimony on that. The email from the health department said they were concerned that the office of the medical examiner had to hold on to those. Hold on, let me toggle between two screens here. I wonder if, it's, if they don't accept it for disposition, but it would be the body. I mean, the medical examiner would have the body. They wouldn't have the remains. Right. And that it wasn't anyway. the testimony that we received from um, from the advocates was that when a body is brought to a, a, an organic reduction facility, that there is a contract right. that determines the disposition of the remains. Yes. Yeah, you know, just no curious. one would get. No one would be. No one would be composted if they were indigent or if they were unknown. Right. Or so it wouldn't be a situation where this comes into play. Where where this may come into play. Then we also took testimony from <coughs> Lermo where sometimes there people just don't yep. come back. Yep. Um, yeah. Lisa. Farther on page nine D one is there line a four talks about the office of medical examiner medical examiner so it says they may contract with a funeral director or disposition facility <coughs> operator to cremate or process the remains of the decedent 
as applicable. So, so maybe that's where we remove this option, that it, it isn't one that the um, Office of Chief Medical Examiner can contract. That might be the one that we want to remove. Hmm. They do have this the where if they contracted, they'd then be stuck with our compost. Yeah, so that might be one to remove. That might be the one we want to edit. Hmm. That makes more sense than the it other line. Does make, it does make more sense than the section that he indicated for me. Um, I would say that the same thing sort of applies here in D1, that the Office of Chief Medical Examiner has the choice. Um, so you could take away the option that they just have to use cremation and they don't have the option to use NOR because it's not practical. Or, you know, you could leave it and then they have the choice. And if they don't have the capacity to use it, then they don't have to choose it. It says they may contract. So I, I think it could probably be left as is. And I think if you feel strongly that that's going to be problematic, it could be changed also. Oh, and later on, I'm sorry to interrupt, it says something about the remains shall be returned to the office of the chief medical examiner, who shall then retain the remains for three years. Oh. So that's on line 17, page nine. So maybe that's what I bet he he, meant. I, I bet you're right. I on bet line he's... 17. Mm. Yep. Yeah. I bet we were looking at the wrong page. Um. Is that just for those that are, These are paid for, for by the Department of Children and Families, though, in that section? No, because that's section A. Section B talks about the decedent um, has not arranged and paid for. Then the Department of Health shall pay expenses to the funeral home. Oh, that is talking about- Up to the maximum. It, it's still talking about DCF. Right. Then, yeah, this, I think it needs a little winnowing because I think we don't want to leave those options. If, if we well, really it does say cremation or. Right. So it doesn't mean that um, if the Department of Children... So I think the or is... But we're putting all that in. So I just feel like maybe we just don't put it there. I mean, if the whole goal is just to give someone the opportunity to choose this for their end times, then it's not necessary to put it into every instance where you have other options. Particularly if there are no options. Exactly. I, I pay or pick up. Yeah, I, I think that we need to. I'm sorry that it came so <laughs> no. well. I think we poked the health department several times saying we'd really like to hear from you and, and they felt they could deal with it in rules. So I am mm -hmm. sorry it's so late that we're hearing. But I just feel that there is a little bit of culling that um, we need to give Katie time to just really assess where those spots might be that it, it isn't practical to have this be an option, but it isn't even feasible for it to be an option because of the ramification that you're, the remains aren't picked up and you're sitting there with three quarters of a cubic yard of remains. I, I've got a question for Key. Uh, I may be misunderstanding of the circumstances in which the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner would, would even be involved. Would that only been be when the cause of death is questionable? No. No, I think when there's a down to get involved. Um well ha we don't have all of the list of A subsection A, but it gives a hierarchy of how decision making is made. Um and I and so I believe it comes into play when we look at that list. So I'd have to switch documents and pull up the existing statute because we don't have the whole piece of law shown here. Um, so let me I'm see just how sharing so I can pull that an up. Issue. Is it an issue for an ordinary death? Is it, chief, is it the office of the chief medical examiner involved in that? I think always when it's a child. And okay, it's just only when it's a DCF case. No, any child. No, any child? Any child passes away, I believe okay. the CMO has to get involved, but I could be wrong. I'd rather have Katie. Um, okay, that's possible, and I would understand, you know, if the 
because the depth is questionable and they, and they want to uh, make sure they know why the person passed away. Uh, but I think that as written, it's fine because there's an or. And why would the Office of Chief Medical Examiner choose National Organic Reduction if they knew they could get stuck with a cubic yard of soil? No. I, I, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm sorry. Well, I'd like Katie's opinion about it the, with the or. So I just wanted to answer the question that was just asked about what role does the chief medical examiner play? So as I was saying in the subsection A of that section, which your bill sort of has the ellipses, so it doesn't show everything, but it's a list of the order in which um, somebody has the right to make a decision about the final disposition of a body. So the last item on that list is A10, the office of the chief medical examiner, when it has jurisdiction and custody of the body, after testing and writing, good faith effort has been made to contact the individuals described in subdivisions A1 through 8. So everybody else, the chief medical examiner has tried to contact everybody else on that list to make a decision. Nobody has been the appropriate person or has stepped forward. Then the chief medical examiner gets to make the decision as to the final disposition of the body in A10 if it gets to that point. And so um, then we are looking at B, where are we? D, D one. If the disposition of the remains of a decedent is determined under A10, so the chief medical examiner is making that determination, um, they may contract with a funeral director um, or the, the new disposition facility to cremate the remains. So it looks like the office of the chief medical examiner has the choice of how they want to dispose of the remains in that particular circumstance. So if they chose to not use NOR because the, of the capacity issue for storing the remains, they could make that choice as the language is written now, or if you don't want them to have that choice, if it is, you know, obviously going to be a storage problem and they shouldn't have that option and they're operating fine as is with cremation and contacting a funeral director for services, then you could remove that option and that would sort of be off the table. So they'd never have to possibly use NOR and have the capacity issue. So they're the ones who choose, choose as if I were to choose the disposition of family members' remains. They're, they become, they become the, the one who chooses between burial, cremation, or, um, or in this case, processing um, decomposition or composting. Mm -hmm. They could, can, again, we don't have an industry here, so you don't have anyone to ask the advocate for this process testified that they work with organizations. She didn't talk about working under these circumstances, about what happens with under these circumstances. I, I mean, we can keep spinning our wheels and saying, <laughs> well, who wants to stop the chief medical examiner from contracting with the composting place and donating the, donating the, the, the compost, the soil when, when it's, it's completed? It's processing. Um, so I just leave it there and just say, well, what you know, what's the pleasure here um, in terms of in terms of moving forward with this? I don't want to spend too too much time um, chasing chasing this if, if we need to take another whatever, whether it's an hour or two or a day, then we need to just sort of make that decision. Mm -hmm. All right. Are you asking for input? Yes, please. I kind of think that if we're offering Vermonters this option, that it should be consistent that it's offered. And so the or is, is comfortable for me. Because it doesn't eliminate the possibility, but doesn't make the uh, office choose this method. So I just think if the methods are offered, they should be offered. So advocating for no language change? No language change for me. 
right, Representative Murphy. I'm still a little bit unclear, but it feels as if what it's saying within the full standing language, as well as what we're changing, that if it is the choice of the chief medical examiner, that they have to hold those remains for three years for them to be claimed if it's being done for someone who is in, an indigent. So they can't <laughs> donate them. They literally have to hold them for those three years, no matter if they choose that. If they choose that option. So I just, I'm not comfortable putting it out there as a choice where there isn't a full understanding that it's really not a choice unless we have built a space where these cubic yards can be maintained for three years as separate entities in case someone comes forward to claim it the way a, a jar of cremains yeah. can be put on a shelf for three years. It, it, I, I just think I, I would hope that maybe we could give Katie enough time to, to disappear for a bit and come back and see if she could laser focus, cut out the little bit that gives the choice to the chief medical examiner. Because I think that's the block that that becomes the issue. Uh, Representative Parsons, then I can. I'll just kind of echo that, I guess. Um, I'm perfectly fine with the idea that they have the option. But the idea that they'd have to keep it for the three years as a separate part of what they have to do. Um, if they didn't have, if they weren't obligated to keep it for those three years in waiting, I'd be perfectly fine with them choosing that. But mm -hmm. the idea that that's also attached to it is kind of a bit of a hurdle for me. So I think it, I think it should be changed. Um, yeah. Representative Packer. I just wanted to point out that in other years past, when we've discussed burials, we have learned that there are a number of unclaimed bodies um, throughout the state of Vermont, and it's a greater number than we ever thought. Um, so I think I remember us being a little bit surprised at how many actually exist. So I think I would like to agree with Representative Murphy on this, at the or at this point, if it's going to be, if they're going to be unclaimed, I don't think that there should be a choice. <laughs> so what would that require again? Go back to the beginning of the, of the, we, we started off by looking at, at what may have not been the right section, but the idea here is what's the, what's the fix? If we're going to not have a choice, right. what is the fix? I, is it one section, not, two sections, five sections? No, if you're not going to have the choice, then you're amending D1 on page nine to just maintain the status quo. So you, well, we would still want to call it a disposition um, facility because we're changing that throughout. Um, so you would just um, not include the words or process and we would remove as applicable. Do how many sections? Just one or two? It's one subdivision. So now I'm confused. <laughs> okay. okay, so if the chief medical examiner chooses to cremate the remains, under current statute, whether the remains are cremated or not, equally even in a buried, if they're unclaimed, they have to hold on to the remains for at least three years mm -hmm. before disposal. Mm -hmm. Now, are we saying that doesn't apply at all? Are we saying it doesn't apply only in the case of natural organic reduction? It would be only in the case, it's, it would be returning that section to what now exists, which just means that as if natural organic reduction didn't exist. So they only, so that under these circumstances, the, that they must cremate. I mean, it's, it's, I think that's a standard operating procedure. That's what we're reading here. And that, but that cremation may not include, won't include natural organic reduction because of the fear of storage for three years. So we so would, basically we would not be changing the statute in this one instance to accommodate natural or organic reduction. We leave the statute as it stands. 
the original sketch. It's not what we have here. That's that's the, with the exception of changing the name. So the concept of a chief medical examiner having to choose to re, you know having to having to be responsible for disposing remains would only be a using conventional or contemporary cremation services and therefore the storage for three years would be an urn and not a garden shed. Well, sometimes it's a casket. I don't, I think this is about cremation. It is. Yep. <clears throat> Representative Murphy. I just wonder, Katie, if we also have to look at um, the cremation or natural organic reduction in 2A and B on page nine lines eight and 13, where it's um, arranged by the Department of Health, whether that as well gets incorporated into that or whether that's still part of what you were speaking to. Yeah, I was looking at that too. Um, I think it's probably a policy decision. Um, it doesn't look, if you look at D3, Right. Um, is it D3? Yeah, where they have to hold the remains for three years. It, right. it doesn't look like, it, it looks like that only applies to the office of the chief medical examiner. I have to take a closer look at 33 VSA 2301 to see if there's a tie in there between DCF and right. somehow the remains being held by the office of the chief medical examiner. Thank you. Okay, so Katie, what is your afternoon like? Uh, uh -huh. um, let's see, I have to be in another committee to mark up a bill at uh, two to three, and then you're on the floor. Um, and then I have an obligation. Floor. What? Floor is oh no, you're not on the floor at three today, I'm sorry. I have an obligation from three to four, so I probably wouldn't sit down to draft it until four o'clock at, at best. Okay. Um, tomorrow. Tomorrow, first thing. Meet at nine. Hey, yeah, why don't we, we just make it eight thirty? <laughs> Let's get this. Why go long at all? Don't we? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> oh, <I'm done. laughs> well, well, may I ask? I mean, why not four thirty? If, um, if it's well, Katie, if you're going to take a look at it for a couple of minutes and see if it's any more, if it's if it's more extensive than just the one change, if it's just the one change, well, let us know. If it's just the one change, can you please make it and have it ready for us at four o'clock, and then um, we'll be here. So um, that would be that, that would be the best case scenario. Okay, I'll do my best. Um, just text Kira or me, let us know if there's a problem um, with that. Okay. We're okay. planning on being here until 4.30 anyway, so. Okay, I'll let you know if I can get it done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> I can't say anything more about that. Oh. <laughs> Well, I am sorry. I really am sorry that they thought that they could just wait till rules to look at it for us. That was the comment. It was repeated to us. Yeah. Well, we're going to get it right now. Well, that's the thing. I don't think it's, it's an excuse. Crossover week. Just yeah. repeat. It's only the first day this week. Other than getting it to the floor and then having it's it good. come up. <clears throat> it's in good shape. If we don't vote on it today, I think we should wait until Thursday to vote on it because of just this requirements. And okay. I, I actually I didn't hear what you said. You said if we don't pass it out today, then you're going to have to do it without your glasses on the floor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, I think we're dealing with a harassment bill next, just in case anyone wants to raise this issue later, as we're talking about harassing people. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Murphy. If we don't pass it, if we're not, if we can't get it out today, I may just hold it off until Thursday morning, and just because of it's crossover week, and maybe we don't want to spend time on the floor with this bill, and we'll just wait till next week to do it. But <clears> we'll see. I think we're going to get it done today. So. Um, all right, Damien. Hey. <laughs> uh, Your so turn. We are here on um, 329. It was another bill that didn't, we didn't really have time to follow up on at all uh, on Friday last. And so Damien had provided us with a document that had. Um, I had asked him to try to talk about that. a lot of the material that we had talked about as being questionable or having questions about. And then um, I just asked him to provide us with an updated draft that we then emailed to some of the people who have testified. And I see that Four Yang is here and, uh, from the Human Rights Commission and Austin Davis is here from Lake Champlain Chamber. Uh, Jordan Giancone is the building. You may try to, from BBSR, you may try to join us, but we shared the draft, this draft that we're, that Damien's going to have to show us right now. And what I did with this was take into account a lot of the comments that we made that people were uncomfortable with. And so this is my interpretation of all of those comments um, based on the conversations that we had. So I'll take responsibility if I got if I missed something or if I got something off. But I wanted to present this because again, it's October week, and I think we're done. I don't think we're done until we vote on it. Um, but I just think now it's time to just narrow down and, and um, present the bill with again taking the comments we heard from different people. So, and I just heard um, after Dayton does this. Does this walk through? If anybody who's here wanted to make a comment about the bill or suggestions, just like as if, just like when we had ninety six, we'll have people in the room and open it up for conversation and see if we can see if we can bring it home. Representative Hango. Um, quick question: Farther along in the bill is um, are the statutes for um, schools? Yeah, and. Did you ever get Chair Webb's input on this bill as you? Yes, yeah, so, so you'll see when we get through it that we deleted the section. Um, we, I reached out to Chair Webb. I also reached out to the School Board Association, Principals Association, the, what the education committee calls the, the V's. <laughs> and um, they, their first response yesterday was, we can talk to you about this bill on the 14th. And I asked them to share thoughts on this bill before that. And while they were um, disappointed that we didn't call them earlier, it was like, well, this was part of a, an amendment that was offered in mid-February. And you know, there was no January on, on this information. Um, but I just, it, it is too complex, Dave, of course, as in the same manner and in the same vein that you were talking about the difficulty of changing language and you know within the school systems and how that works um that they presented a they presented a letter i don't know who <laughs> yes. and so um but even before getting that you know part of the thinking on this was it, it was identified as a fairly complex issue and so this proposal deletes that from this version of the bill. If the advocates want to bring it forward, they can bring it forward in the Senate um, on education or not, and then we'll deal with it as, but it's the safest thing to do is to, is to delete it because it's clear that it would require quite a bit of conversation with, with the interested parties. Okay. For the record, Damian Leonard, Legislative Council, this is the most packed this room has been. <laughs> um, I remember. I, 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 after two years. Yeah. 
I saw your son for the first time in person today for the first time in two years as well. Two, oh my gosh. <laughs> Getting the whole family. Yes. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm so used to seeing everyone over, over video. Uh, so as the chair mentioned, this is uh, this latest draft before the break. I sent the committee a highlighted draft, which is on today's webpage as draft 1.1. This is draft 2.1 which essentially incorporates the removal of things that were identified as uh, being uh, controversial or, or non-starters in the bill um, that needed to come out for crossover week. So um, let me share my screen here and I'll walk you through the bill. Um, great, thank you so much. Whoops. <laughs> Did I do that? There we go. <laughs> okay. Except on YouTube. <laughs> um, so the first section of the bill here, there's no changes on the, the first page. Going on to the second page, it's not until we get down to subsection I uh, where we get to a change in the language. Uh, so looking at subsection I, what we deleted there is the internal grievance language. So we're taking out the language there that an employee's decision not to pursue an internal grievance. Uh, would not be determinative in any claim that an employer uh, violated a provision of this section against discrimination. So what we've left is an employee shall not be required to demonstrate the existence of another employer or individual to whom the employee's treatment can be compared in determining whether a violation of the provisions of this section occurred. Um, are there questions on that change? Okay. Uh, in J, uh, so that's the next subsection here. Uh, we have struck out the language saying that the General Assembly finds that claims of unlawful discrimination are rarely appropriate for summary judgment. So that was taken out. Uh, and so what that leaves us with is Notwithstanding uh, judicial precedent to the contrary, the provision shall be construed liberally to accomplish uh, the section's remedial purpose and any exceptions and exemptions shall be construed narrowly in order to maximize the deterrence of discriminatory behavior. And then on the next. I, I just want to put forward that I do appreciate the changes so far, but that that first um, uh, first J is, is something that I still have concerns with. I think it's a little bit of us telling judiciary, telling the judicial system how to behave, <clears throat> rather than really saying what we believe is harassment. And, and I don't think it's appropriate from our committee. Okay. <clears throat> um, this is the notwithstanding. Just yeah. the provisions of this section shall be considered yeah. liberally. Uh, that language, I think, is us telling a judge how to look at something. And I think we're, we're writing the law that is to be looked at. We're not judiciary and we're not. I, I was just going to ask for like clarification on what it's exactly, how, how do you even guide that, right? Like to be construed as, you know, liberally. I mean, that's kind of. So the, the judge still determines what that means. This is that language. So line 17 is something that is out of the ordinary for us, but it's not. Okay, so I'm going to back up here and I'm going to try to phrase everything very carefully because I don't have a position on this language and I'm not here to advocate for or against the language in the bill. So line 17 is a line where saying it explicitly like that, notwithstanding any precedent to the contrary, is not something we do very frequently. That said, legislatures do from time to time pass a law that overrides a judicial decision because they disagree with the judicial decision. So that, that's the first piece there. So 
that language is a little unusual. The making a change because the legislature doesn't agree with the way the judiciary has been going on an issue is not necessarily unusual. I wouldn't say it's it's normal or frequent, but it's something that legislatures do from time to time when they believe an adjustment needs to be made. Um, typically, that gets done through a clarification of a term, the elimination of something that's problematic, change to language, something like that. The lines 18 to 21, this is actually fairly common language to the extent that there's about, there's several dozen instances of language like this in the VSA, understanding that the VSA is, is thousands of sections, but there are several dozen instances of this in the Vermont statutes. And this is basically saying, we'd like you to construe this liberally. This is a remedial statute. We want you to construe exceptions and exemptions narrowly. By itself, uh, this might not have much effect on judicial rulings. It could, it depends on the judge. With the language in line 17, I think what you're saying here, and the way a judge would read this is they're saying, <clears throat> look back at the judicial precedent, and if it's not construing this section liberally or narrowly construing the exceptions, then you need to revisit that and look at it in light of this new language. So, and that I think is the, the effect here that, that um, is, is probably that's the policy issue to discuss is are you, does the committee want to ask the judiciary to revisit instances when there's an exception that may not have been construed as narrowly as possible and so forth. So that's, that is that piece there. The other piece here is of course the language here, harassment and discrimination need not be severe or pervasive. So this is, again, notwithstanding any judicial precedent to the contrary, harassment and discrimination need not be severe or pervasive. So there's really, I would read those as two separate clauses. Uh, and particularly within the first clause, this with line 17, you're saying, if there's a precedent that construed an exception, look at it to make sure it's being construed narrowly in order to maximize deterrence or that it's being construed, if it's another clause, is it being construed liberally to accomplish the remedial purposes of the <laughs> chapter or should you revisit that and construe it more liberally? So it still leaves this up to judicial discretion to say, we think this is narrow enough, but this could be a subject for uh, litigation or, or for argument in a case that comes up at some point in the future. So. Um, <clears throat> I just said, I think in its entirety, the, the J1 and 2 just, I have spoken before, I don't think I'm just bringing this up fresh <clears throat> together. And, and I think that this, the, the J2 gives that voice of, what we have been saying in these corrections that it need not be severe or pervasive <clears throat> to. And I think this is just feeling, again, more than I'm comfortable saying, I guess, it's, no, it's, I, I, it's noted. taking it further. So. It's noted. Okay. Any other questions or issues there? Okay. So the next change is here uh, going down whoop, the, so there are some issues or some language in the grass definition that were highlighted for discussion, but I wasn't asked to make changes to them. So I'm not going to touch on them right now. Uh, the next is the legislative intent in the Fair Housing and Public, public Accommodations Law. Um, so it used to say uh, 
legislative findings and intent. I've taken out the findings because we've removed the language that says the General Assembly finds that summary judgment is generally not appropriate. Uh, the section highlighting here or subsection highlighting is just because we didn't need to renumber there. We took out a subsection. And then again, we're back to the language that Representative Murphy and I were just discussing, notwithstanding any judicial precedent to the contrary, the provisions of this chapter shall be construed liberally to accomplish its remedial purpose and any exceptions and exemptions <coughs> shall be construed narrowly. So. And I just have to say, sir. Right, so Representative Blumen. Yeah, <clears throat> I am. Um, uh, so um, one of our witnesses, Karen Stackpole, has said that at, that it actually did not object to that language and see, saw it as helpful to a court. Um, I, I don't know if that's, it, you know, and I had my intern actually <clears throat> um, search statute for that very language to just see how many times it came up and in what context and it's everything from stuff of um, like affecting the National Guard to <clears throat> um, education law. To, I mean, it, it seems to appear in a number of places, um, which is why, I mean, it was something I wasn't familiar with. So um, uh, hearing that from, from attorney Stackpole helped. <clears throat> Uh, and it's it's just to to clarify that statement there the the language from here lines sixteen to nineteen mm -hmm. is the language that appears commonly in the VSA. Um, I am not sure how often language not saying notwithstanding any precedent to the contrary appears. So those <laughs> just to to. Um, clarify that a little bit there, but the, the language from 16 to 19 is fairly common. So, um, let's see. Oh, <coughs> well, I, uh, severe and pervasive, severe or pervasive, that some courts were now saying it was both, right? And we're trying to clarify that now, that it's neither or, right? Neither severe or pervasive. But wouldn't this help? Because if the court cases have tightened it and we're ruling for severe and pervasive, then this language would actually help clarify what our intent is and to say to the judiciary, you can't really, that, that's how I, I'm reading. So I, I see it. Um, Why well, is this on the screen? So <laughs> I see the <laughs> <laughs> head. He heard his face. <laughs> And Karen, it looks like you're having a reaction to uh, the Kalaki. Nice. <laughs> so I have, a, have to, I have to have a better poker face, is what you're saying? Uh -huh. we, 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 that's been called a Zoom face now. So, uh, so yes, yeah, do you have a thought on? Do you have a thought on this on this language? Yeah, I mean, I guess all I would say is that I don't, I don't have any general and 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 I think that um, Representative Bloomley, you know, we had definitely had some conversation about this. I don't have any basic problem with the expressed intent, meaning this is what we intend. But I don't agree with the last statement that you know what that means is that it can be interpreted different than the actual words in the statute itself. So if the courts then you know the courts are going to look at the words on the page. And they're going to interpret from the words on the page, but if the uh, if there's variance in the language uh, between you know sections, um, and I didn't see the severe pervasive language in that particular section, um, then I, I just don't know that it works exactly the same way it was just described. My my concern was just how it was just described in terms of how courts would look at it for courts to have some guidance from the legislature saying, hey, look, we want you to do this. We want you to take the words that we've put in this statute and, uh, and apply them liberally. You're giving some expression of your intent. And expression of intent is looked at by courts sometimes when they are determining a matter. What matters to them more, frankly, is you know, the facts 
and the words in the actual statute, but if there is a lack of clarity in the words, they will go back to look at the intent for the purposes of defining it. So that's my only, that was my only thought. Thank you. Damien, are we, are we, did we get to all the changes? <laughs> um, let's take a quick look here. Um, so uh, the other changes here uh, is just the elimination of the Title 16 language and then renumbering the remaining sections. So those are the other uh, changes in this draft. And I, I just, uh, I did a quick search. There is no section I was able to find in the VSA that says notwithstanding judicial precedent to the contrary. Uh, there was, there has been legislative language that says this is just a change in terminology, not intended to overrule judicial precedent. But I couldn't find language in a West law search. That doesn't mean we haven't done it before in session law somewhere. Um, but within the Vermont statutes uh, that show up in a Westlaw search, that language doesn't appear. The language between lines 16 and 19 appears <clears throat> roughly 100 times, um, but I haven't checked each instance to confirm that it's actually in the statutory language. But that's it for me. Can you take the not the standing line out and have the provision under it still be stand on its own legs? Yeah, that could stand on its own legs. Um, I think, you know, as as uh, Karen was just alluding to here, the judges are going to continue reading the words on the page, so it may or may not actually affect the way they rule because they're constrained by the language of the statute, um, and. It is already a remedial statute. So in many instances, they're already going to be construing it liberally to accomplish the intent or the apparent intent of the legislature. Um, the, the, I think that language applies a little bit more uh, that notwithstanding judicial precedent has a, I'm, again, I'm trying to be very careful with how I word things here so I don't appear to be putting my finger on the scale. Um, the, the notwithstanding language with the severe or pervasive where there is a clear, severe or pervasive precedent, uh, there I think it makes a lot of sense to include the notwithstanding judicial precedent to the contrary, even though saying it need not be severe or pervasive would essentially express that, but it you know is being extremely clear that your intent would be to override that if you include that language and move forward. Um, with this other other language, I'm not sure the extent to which, and maybe Karen has more thoughts, the extent to which it might influence any existing sort of rulings on uh, you know in in employment discrimination law, whether saying we'd like you to construe this liberally through exceptions narrowly would affect existing precedent. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it would or not. So <clears throat> and I think the point. Well, actually, Karen, can I ask you a question? Sure. <clears throat> The point of clarifying this in the way that it's been clarified is to make discrimination claims or the process somewhat more accessible to people. I mean, it, it is that, I mean, that's, I know this, you didn't sponsor this bill. You, you testified on this bill. You had some very cogent thoughts on it and I'm just, this this language does what for people who are trying to bring a discrimination case forward, in your opinion? So I think this particular language that you're just talking about that last that last segment, I'm not sure tons. And and that very first part of it that isn't commonly in statutes, I would agree that's not commonly in statutes, and it's probably something 
I wouldn't um, I wouldn't vote for on that. I'd be interested to what to see what Judiciary Committee had to, to think about that. This interaction between the legislature and the courts, you know, the courts have a body of law that they're supposed to be dealing with, which is precedent, right? And so it's how they take a statute and then they apply it to the specific facts of that particular case. That's not changed really in, in this except you're essentially trying to force the court's hand by saying, forget about all your prior precedent, we want you to just deal with this. Um, for, for my money, I, I don't think that's a, a necessarily the, the best piece of this legislation because I think the courts work in tandem. I think to say, this is our broad intent, we would like this to be construed as broadly as you can with regard to the words. Again, that's language that appears in a lot of statutes, that makes sense. Right. But to go back and say, except notwithstanding any precedent, I think you're being heavy handed, no offense, um, with regard to the courts in terms of how the courts have to deal with their precedent, too. They're going to deal with changes in your law. They're going to deal with the elements that change. But I, I, I'm not a fan of that particular front part. And there's a reason it's not commonly found in statutes. Is that a oh, I just wanted to, I, as more gang is on um, as well. I just wanted to get um, her take on this. <clears throat> Hi, Bor. Hello, how are you? Thank you. Good. Thank you for joining <laughs> us again. And as, um, as really a, a primary voice on this bill, I, I think you might have some thoughts on what we've been discussing, are you, would you like to share them? Yeah, I, um, and um, thank you, Karen, too. Um, it's nice to see you. I just wanna say in general that, re that the anti-discrimination laws are remedial statutes. And, and, and as Damien said, that re remedial statutes are enacted to fix a problem, to fix a wrong. And so when we enacted our anti-discrimination laws, we already made a decision. These are statutes that we are enacting to fix something that we see as a problem. So courts already construe these as liberally. That's already sort of the way that courts review it. So you're not really heavy handed because you're really just codifying what courts already do with remedial statutes. Mm -hmm. Also, this if you, pa if you pass this bill, you are in effect creating kind of you're saying that the severe or pervasive stat standard that has been used for harassment claims is now going to be different, that we're looking at a different um, set of standard for how we look at harassment. So it makes sense then to include that language that says notwithstanding precedent, because we are actually moving forward and like sort of avoid in, in many ways saying that that precedent was too hard and difficult. We are now setting the standard for the way that we look at harassment. It makes sense to include that. Um, so that's sort of my position about it. I, I don't think that it is should be uh, highly contested. Um, yeah. I'm happy to answer any questions. Representative Kalaki, you have all oh, good. Representative Trial. So, were we seeing a degree of ambiguity in the arguments that have been in court surrounding this language? I mean, were, were, were courts having a difficult time um, coming in on either side's argument as a result of uh, some ambiguity in, in severe and pervasive? So where that intent language can be helpful is when the courts are not sure when they're reading the plain language of the statute. They're not sure which way to go. They try to read and interpret the plain language of the statute to effectuate the purpose, the intent. So they would go back to this intent language and go, the legislature intended for us to review the statute liberally, and that might lean in favor of the individual who's claiming that there's a violation here. That doesn't mean that they win. That just means that 
that whatever, if there's confusion in the interpretation, a court is going to look at the intent language, right? But again, I think Karen said it well, is that it doesn't contradict the plain language of the statute. They are going to look at the plain language of the statute. And if it's clear, they follow that. Only when there's ambiguity or they need to figure out how they should interpret it, if there's confusion, they go to the intent language to see. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think Bohr also makes the point that you are intentionally changing the standard here in this bill, you know, by, by saying it need not be severe or pervasive. Um, so that, that is a significant change that you are making already in the standard that exists. Which is the heart of the bill. So the policy yes. change, the policy change for us is, are we willing to make that change? That's really, you know, that's. Yeah. Representative Byron. Um, my question is actually a little bit previous to that. Um, it was highlighted on the copy of the 1.1 for committee discussion. Um, was it C6? conduct occurred outside of the workplace mm -hmm. was highlighted on this, but it's not highlighted here. Um, I asked Damien to, um, when I asked Damien to go through the document, I asked him to keep that in because I don't think we had, I wanted to be able to ask these folks mm -hmm. about that standard because we heard, we heard that the standard is very much part of law. And, and there, there was some conversation in committee of that it should be deleted or that it's irrelevant or what have you. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to I wanted to keep it in for this conversation. Yeah, I'm pulling up the language. But... <laughs> yeah, that's just that's that's one of the big boxes for me to check is that one. So let's see if I can go. You're almost there. It's line one on the page you're on. Correct. Yeah, line one five. Yeah. <clears throat> you just have to scroll us down a little further, Damien. Oh. Oh, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. That we were talking about. All right. That was. Uh, I'm sure it did two spots at one point. Yeah. I don't know if it's still there. It's only in one, I yeah. think, now. I it's in two spots. Two it's in both the public accommodation. There you go. There you go. Top of that page. So let me see if. Oh. <clears throat> Can we hear from. <clears throat> there we go. I'm trying to get you more of the text. So. Um, so while we have um, Bohr and Karen here, um, if you could just take a look at line one at the very bottom of the screen here. We had a lengthy conversation and disagreement over whether or not this language was either relevant or was um, necessary or, um, or should be deleted. And we, um, again, it, it was marked in an earlier draft as, as a conversation point. So we're going to take some time here and, and just and converse about it. And Representative Murphy? Well, I just wanted to say that I, I had raised concerns about this, and I don't think my concerns were necessarily connected to it being relevant or necessary. It was just whether it is proper in my mind to assign an actionable um, case, however we word it, to something that happens outside a workplace, to have a workplace owner be responsible for something that occurs outside the workplace, that that, that was the piece. It, it wasn't that, they, I just want to make sure it's described as I had seen it, that I, I, if I were an employee, employer, and my employee attacked another employee, employee out in a parking lot after an event or something that had nothing to do with the workplace, I don't feel that that should come back on me as the employer, but it could. And, and I guess that's a question, could it? Is this saying that if two employees get into it somewhere and, and can I be held responsible for that? Before we jump, to, I, I, the big thing for me with this is I think it's just, it, it's vague where it's like outside of the workplace. An employer has no control over the, really has no control over the behavior of their employees when they're off the clock and off the premise. So, you know, if, so if this occurred while they were like 
off site outside of the work environment, but engage in a work capacity, like an event or something off site. Mm-hmm. Totally different story. Because then they are engaged as a like surrogate of the factory with you or your entity. That's the flip. Now, if the conduct when they're outside of the workplace is so extreme that it then creates an on-site issue between the two, that's the circle back. Then it's an on-site thing. But you just to to say that you have to that you're liable for the conduct of somebody's behavior outside of work when they're not on the clock or acting on behalf of the business, I'm not comfortable. So just just to provide read-in in case or lead-in language in case Warren and Karen don't have the full document in front of them. The lead-in to all of these subdivisions is conduct may constitute harassment regardless of whether and then the following. So yeah, I can I can just tell you that the current state of the law is that if something happens outside of the workplace but has an impact inside the workplace, basically what you just described, it can be something that an employer is liable for if they're aware of it and they don't do anything to stop it. I'll just give you the easiest example is people texting each other, um, you know, after hours using their own phones. If I'm sending people, you know, naked pictures uh, in an unwelcome sort of way guess what, that may be upsetting to them and it's gonna have an impact likely of us in the workplace, um, or it could, let me put it to you that way. So if it can have and does have an impact in the workplace, an employer will have to deal with it in one way, shape or form. And the employer, A, as a best practice, but B, as a matter of law, if I'm aware that that out of office behavior is occurring and it has a negative impact in the workplace, it's something I have to deal with. And it's something for which I can be liable if I refuse to deal with it. Or do you, you I, I've assumed Bore and I agree, but I'm, I welcome her thoughts as well. We do. And I think what I'm hearing almost as the underlying concern from some committee members is the concern around notice. This language does not get rid of the fact that an employer still has to be on notice when coworkers harass each other. So the fact that we have this language here doesn't mean that an employer is liable when they don't know what's going on. They still have to be on notice. An employee would still have to say, I notified the employer, I followed the rules, I I did so forth, right? So like that is what I'm hearing as the underlying problem about trying to capture things outside the workplace. But as Karen mentioned, the law already covers things that occur outside the workplace. So all this <laughs> language is doing is codifying existing law. Okay. And um, I did listen to some of the discussion that ha- occurred around this. And uh, Representative Kalaki did a really great job of talking about how often the case is, is that harassment is occurring outside of the workplace through text messages, through mm-hmm. emails. Um, and, and it's not on you. Like if you think about um, Harvey Weinstein, who is what we see as the, the worst perpetrator of sexual harassment, all of his actions occurred outside the workplace. They were in hotel rooms, not at the studio. And so it's not unusual for someone who is a harasser to in fact use emails and other circumstances to harass people, to pick them up at the airport, to do all of those things. And it's not actually inside the four walls of a building. So I, I would just say employers, are not held responsible for coworker harassment on coworker unless they have notice. This does nothing to impact the fact that the court would still require notice. Representatives, <laughs> boy, <laughs> Maybe Carson is or Carson. Okay, so so okay. This is a question for you, Damien. The, the, as I read this section, I um, this <clears throat> puts into law what is essentially in case law, um, and it, you know, uh, it giving clear it clarifies guidance to the courts um, in terms of how you know how the courts can view harassment. You know, what would constitute harassment. <clears throat> Yeah, my understanding is that this is 
essentially repeating the the standards that have set out in case law. Um, it's it's I think a good way to think of the section is that the it's defining what harassment is based on uh, based around existing case law, um, and it and I I would defer to Karen or Bohr to contradict me if I've misstated that, um, since they are both much more experienced practitioners in this area. Um, but the, the key is that it starts off with it's, it's unwelcome conduct that interferes with the employee's work or creates a work environment that is intimidating, hostile, or offensive. And then in determining whether it constitutes harassment, it's going through A, B, and C is this, it may constitute harassment regardless of whether, and it then goes through these. So first, it does have to relate back to the actual work environment. So simply the fact that you engage in inappropriate behavior outside of work isn't necessarily action, isn't necessarily unlawful employment discrimination. Or harassment, unless it's really interfering with the work or creating a hostile working environment. And then Board just described the standards for employer liability, which gets back to the language that we deleted earlier, which would have allowed, into, uh, which would have uh, impacted the employer's ability to say, I wasn't aware that this was occurring. I wasn't on notice, so there was nothing I could do about it. So I, I shouldn't be held liable because I wasn't even on notice that this occurred. So and I see Karen has has popped back in. So mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chair, I, I would yield to her just in case there's a correction uh, that she'd like to make. Go ahead, Karen. Sorry, we can't see you while we're screen you're sharing oh. the screen, but but go ahead. You'll come up on our little thumbnail here. Yeah. There you are. No, no, I completely I, I agree with what was just explained about that particular piece. I think all it does is codify what currently exists. And I think you read it exactly right. It's, you know, this is this doesn't say that every action outside of work is something that somebody can, you know, bring a cause of action under the discrimination statute about. It's something that may happen outside of the office that may have an impact in the workplace. I think I think you did it. You think you said it right. Representative Parsons. Um, I think I'll just, um, I uh, don't like having the language in there and it seems like it's kind of a consensus amongst others that this language doesn't really do anything with the way that it's already dealt with. Meaning that if we take it out of there, we are also not doing anything to change it. If the language in there does nothing, I've heard, <coughs> and with it gone, it also does not. No. Representative Murphy, I I appreciate um, both Karen and Board giving giving us their expertise as well as Damian on on all of this and. I had not made all the links back to the first sift of section 16 and then everything being out of that. So I appreciate the, the tailing back when we see things in their isolation, they can look more in, imposing. Um, and I would just say that, that codifying something that currently is done actually does have value, that, that, that there, is, um, there is reason to put something in, even if it feels like it doesn't make a shift, it can just, give a, a thumb approval to something that we are doing. So um, I, I appreciate being helped to a comfort level on that, but I still really don't like the other section that I've been yammering about a lot today. <laughs> Representative Hango. So the section that Representative Murphy is yammering about, <laughs> which I can't find right now, I'm looking at for it, but is this bill going to go to judiciary? Because I've been, I think, saying that since it start, since we started looking at it, I just feel like this is so out of my comfort zone. Um, that particular section that Representative Murphy is talking about, I just can't wrap my head around it. And maybe it's just me. But um, my conversations with judiciary is that they be they would welcome a drive by when we were ready to drive something by. That's good. Thank you. 
Representative Murphy. I, I will go back to page five, section C, et cetera, et cetera, the notwithstanding um, construed liberally paragraph that does occur twice. And I have absolutely no comfort level with it. I, I would like to see it removed. And if it stays, I'm not sure I can vote for this at all, but I certainly need to see this go fully to judiciary, not just the chair of judiciary giving a thumbs up on it. I, I need to see that committee truly have a moment to take testimony on it. So I, I don't know what that does to the still in our week that we're in. Well, we have to reach out to judiciary and see if they have time. I don't know that there's time for them to own it. Right. Um, but if they have time for a, for a walkthrough and a drive-by and an understanding of what the concerns are, um, you know, we could try to arrange that. And um, I don't know if you want to, you know, if that's sufficient for you, but uh, we have to find out what their schedule is. Well, I just, I, I feel like we're, we're not hearing, I, I don't understand why we need to leave it in, I guess. I, I'm not sure where I hear at this committee that this is language that we feel we fully require. And, and um, which part of it, the whole thing or, or the notwithstanding phrase? The piece that's all in the law already, or the line that both of them in the in the in the language that we're changing because we're adding it to this piece of law. So it's not in this section of law. It's one that's considered in many areas of law, and it sounds like judiciary those those in the judging seats use for their um, actions. So I I just don't see the the dedication to it being in this bill. I think that. As you said earlier, the, the germ of this bill, the goal of this bill is truly, the, the heart of the bill is the harassment and discrimination need not be severe or pervasive, or pervasive to constitute a violation of this section. I think we're doing several pieces in here that, that really do move along. We want people not to be harassed. And, and I just think this piece isn't what I can support. And I, I would like to support this bill. Could, could I, 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 I heard Chair ask something else, so I, I'm, I'm, I'll ask my version. Are you asking for the one line notwithstanding the state of federal to the president contrary to be taken out and the rest stay because that rest is the whole, the whole paragraph in both instances that it appears in this bill? Because I believe I've heard witnesses speak to the fact that it, it is practice and I don't feel this is something we need to codify in that manner. May I ask Damien here um, as legislative counsel, if, if that paragraph was taken out, does it change any of the intent of the bill? So uh, getting back to the discrimination section, um, the employment discrimination <laughs> section, um, it's it's a little bit tough for me to speak to intent of the bill since uh, I am I'm not the representative for presenting the bill. Um, but so there there are sort of three different pieces here. The the first is um, taking out if we're just looking at subdivision one. I don't know that that has a huge effect on the bill it's page, um, page five or what page yeah that? so we are on page page two, two. And yeah, page two. two. so I'm, I'm just in the employment discrimination yes. law yes. this language appears again yes later in the bill but so just looking at subdivision one here uh you know i don't think this has a huge effect because courts do already construe it liberally um, that said, this provides, as Bohr mentioned, guidance if they get to a point where there's something that they haven't made a determination on yet, and they're trying to figure out what the intent of the legislature was. This is the legislature saying it's our intent that you do this. The second part of this is the notwithstanding any state or federal judicial precedent to the contrary. Leaving that language in with one indicates that there may be instances where the precedent should be not withstood. 
Um, and that, that raises some uncertainty. I can't say how the court's going to rule in every instance, but that raises, basically it raises the argument when a case goes to court that the prior exception was not narrow enough and it should be this exemption or exception should be construed more narrowly or the prior the prior precedent on this issue isn't construing the statute liberally enough therefore we should not withstand that and it should be construed more liberally i can't say how the court's going to rule on that but it does raise uncertainty um with with that the third piece of this is the severe or pervasive so I think you really probably need to look at this as, do you wanna say notwithstanding any state or federal judicial precedent to the contrary for each, both paragraph one, which is the construe it liberally and paragraph two, which is it need not be severe or pervasive. And as you've heard, severe or per taking away the severe or pervasive standard would be a significant change in the standard. So, and as I understand it, that's sort of the heart of the intent of this bill. So taking that language out would, would be a significant change in what the, what my understanding of the, the intent of the supporters of this bill is. The, so, and with that, I think it's worth saying, notwithstanding any precedent to the contrary, because that is the precedent. Um, so the, I think those questions really should be considered in isolation. Um, I mean, you could say, let's just take it all out, obviously, but they are, they are different issues. So there's first the you know, liberal construction. The second question is, if you're gonna keep liberal construction, do you say notwithstanding judicial precedent or not? And then the third is the severe or pervasive piece, which I think uh, really should be read with the notwithstanding language, because even if that's not there, that's what you're implying is be, we're, we're saying that precedent shouldn't apply anymore. And I appreciate that, David, because that's so, that was what I was trying to lay out is that it's that one, number one paragraph that I'm striking, not the, not not the J to go with two, because two. we have heard that two has not been <laughs> determined in that manner before. So we would be asking it to be not withstood the precedent. Mr. Chair, so that's what I, I thought you were heading towards here. So you will have, go ahead, um, Karen. Hold on a sec. We're, yeah, sure. Just in, for clarity, and this is where I thought you were going with this when this started. It's it's keep the J, the notwithstanding. Lose the one. Yes. Keep the two. Yes. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. Karen. Yeah, I thank you for the opportunity to, to 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 speak on this. I do think that there are enough pieces in here in this particular bill. Um, and looking at the markup um, that change current law, not the least of which is the severe or pervasive. And that's an area on which reasonable people can disagree and Bohr and I probably disagree on it. But I bottom line is that I think these have significant impacts where the either the intent is to change it, is to change that current law or the impact may be to significantly change that law. And that's why my recommendation is that judiciary take a look at it so that they can figure out where does it go with regard to some of those other um, pieces that might, that might impact it both on the public accommodation side and on the employment side. That's just my, my basic thought. Thank you for listening. All right, Committee. So, where are we on this bill right now? From what I understand, from what I understand, that at least in the, you don't, Bar Representative Murphy, you don't care for the liberal, the, 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 the directive to the courts to narrow liberal in both circumstances. Correct. Um, and that's and and your other concerns have been. I can have, with the rest. have been discussed. And and would I be misunderstanding that earlier on, as we've taken testimony on this, you said that um, judiciary has looked at the severe pervasive. That is something that's no. Okay, they, so we still I want need to, drive to reach out to them okay. and 
and I and I think I would use the term drive by. I would use the, you know a walk through. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'd like to see them vote on this. Um, not sure you'll get a vote on it per se. You might get a you might get a consensus or a straw poll on it. Yeah, well, yeah, that's it's like poll. I, 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 a straw poll time. Like I guess like. Yeah, I misspoke. Like, I would just like to have like a baseline understanding of how they supported this language through their mindset. Sure, I can go hustle down there and try to schedule some time in and see what their schedule is like and have them take a look at it. So, so could you, Barbara, show me the pages and the line numbers that you're talking about so I understand <clears throat> clearly? Yeah, do you have it up? I have it up. Okay, page two, yes, lines 18 to 21 would Eight. disappear. You would keep 17 in, yes, okay, good. And it would tie to what would then just be a complete sentence, including that goes to what now is number two on the next page. So it would get renumbered because it wouldn't be J2, uh, okay, but, but it would. I got it there, okay, yeah. and then the same occurs on page five. Um, but in the sense that it just comes out completely because there's no one and two. Line 15 on page five, 15 through 19 would just disappear. 15 you would keep? No. You would take there's out. nothing for it not to withstand. If the only thing it's not withstanding is that liberal, um, narrow language. So there's no reason to keep the notwithstanding because there's nothing else that you're not withstanding. So that whole paragraph would remove, be removed. Yeah, it's it doesn't have that follow-up of <clears throat> harassment and discrimination that may, may not be severe or pervasive. That's not part of that one. So yeah, that's in the, the definition in section four. Yeah. Not be severe or pervasive is on that language appears in section 4501 right. under that. So it's it's a separate spot. Yeah, lines eleven to thirteen <laughs> on page six. And that does still maintain the notwithstanding next to that language. Yep. So you're still getting that change that we're trying to have occur is still being said to be our intent. <laughs> well, I, what, what I like about what, I, what I'm hearing is that we're, we're, we're really showing that neither severe or pervasive is a change. And we want to make sure that that's clear. And that if that's, yeah, and that we're changing precedent where that has not been the case. Yes. Well, I, I, would, I would be good with all of it. All right, well, I'm going to reach out to, well, <coughs> so if I bring this to the judiciary to I guess the question on this language once more, just for my clarity, yeah. is is this what you want an opinion for the judiciary on? What is this? What do you this mean? that language? The request I'm making to have something removed? Yes. Is or is no, it more the it's, bill it's, as a whole? It's well, it's yeah, I, I think that it's the bill as a whole, but also mm -hmm. I, I really am not comfortable with that language. So even if they support it, it doesn't mean I'll be voting for the bill. <laughs> okay, Representative Yeah, I I definitely have been wanting since we first saw this bill for them to weigh in on the intent of the bill to begin with. The content of it and, and what's behind it and the change from um, to this not having to be severe or pervasive. Um, yeah, the whole bill. Okay. Then, Damien, just for um, for purposes of a conversation with judiciary mm -hmm. on this bill, what I would. Um, understanding that people are opposed to the language, the, the liberal versus um, <clears throat> those two paragraphs. Um, can you present, can you provide a draft for us to share with them that will have that language bracketed? Mm -hmm. 
right? Because I think it's worth discussing. <laughs> um, I mean, I think what I would want to hear from them on that language, if we were to hear it, is to hear how <clears throat> how it may be used in their work. Understanding where people feel about the language in the first place. Um, and then I'll reach out to the committee, or we can reach out to the committee and find if there's a time to um, discuss. It looks like their schedule is more open on Thursday. They're doing the same thing we're doing, which is loading up the next two days on their most important bills. So uh, I will reach out to them and find out what their situation is. <clears throat> but I am hearing that other than those two paragraphs, regardless of what the final vote may be on this, those two those two paragraphs, there's there's I won't say there's a full committee consensus, but that there's there's a desire to delete those two paragraphs. But the rest of the language that we're talking about after the deletions that we've made. Um, are sufficient at this point to make a decision on. And I, I just want to share that I appreciate the, the deletions. There has been substantial for anyone that hasn't been following all along. Um, if you took the side by side by side home with you, there's several that I had marked. It was like, whoa, that wasn't supposed to be there anymore. And it's not in this version. And so I do appreciate how much has been edited from. Yeah. So. And I, I you know, this is, the, this is the way it goes in the week before crossover. It feels like how did we not do this before? But somehow you just don't until it's truly this is it. Well, that's right. Tick, tick, tick. You know, but also, as we learned today so far, that had we voted on this bill last Friday, page 244. Yeah, <laughs> we'd be questioning ourselves. You know, or you just see this one line and you just roll your eyes again. And I mean, we just had this experience with 517. And, where someone, you know, another committee is going to take a look at the bill with Representative Hango because of you know, where where did a list come from? Which which we do mention. I mean, these are things that come up, but somehow we lose sight of them in the big picture when we think we're just sort of amorphously moving through things. And, and they may have came come from the same place, but people describe them in different words, you know, and you know, so. Um, Representative Hangel will go at four o'clock on that, and um, and I mean, um, we'll see what happens with, with Katie. Um, I like to take uh, I like to take a ten minute break.